Say hi. You want to show Pastor Dan what you're reading? Last night it was the Bible. Tonight it's Star Wars. Both good and in the right order too. Yeah, I think that's good. <laughs> you your priorities right there. <laughs> that's amazing. I didn't even know they made Star Wars like princess girls books. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, Vader's little princess. And then there's a boy one with Luke. Right on. That's great. I love those um, eggs that you made for the uh, for the scavenger hunt. Those are great. Thanks. Yeah, they turned out super well. And they're with the branding and costed no money because I cut up the um, prayer room yeah. sign that I took home. And yeah. then I had a bunch of white vinyl that I just used. Perfect. Can I say goodnight? Is your Baba online right now, Julia? I think she is. Can you wave? Say goodnight. No? Okay, then. Oh, well, good night. We'll see you in a bit. Hey, good night. See you, Julia. <laughs> All right, you guys, welcome. Hope you've had an amazing week. Ashton, good to see you. I noticed that last week, uh, I forgot to answer a question that you submitted, the one about the seven deadly sins. So we're gonna cover that tonight. So yeah, no, I didn't I didn't overlook it completely. It was just temporary, so. <laughs> hey, Jen, how are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm fine, but for the snow. I mean, come on. <laughs> And it's still snowing. I know. And it's going to be warm again. And then we have another day of snow. It's like, make up your mind. Must be March. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's about right. I I'm grateful that we've had the warmth that we have. So. Yep. Okay. Let's see. Kyle, let me make you co-host. Boom. Hey, Cara, how's it going? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for helping us out with the um, Easter worship. I'm so excited. I can't yeah. wait to sing. <laughs> yeah, me, too. me too. Like I'm, I'm so pumped because we're only like the building is only about three weeks away from being done. So we're really just a few weeks away from being back in person, like regularly. But Ooh, yeah, time. I know. But finally, um, having a plan for Easter that at least lets us be in person and you know the opportunity for you guys to sing and all that. So I'm just really looking forward to it. My vocals are so rusty, it feels. I was singing today and I was like, mm. <laughs> Oh, I know how that feels. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm legit nervous about like speaking in front of people live again. I'm like, man, I haven't done this in a year or so. <laughs> Right. Got another minute or two. We'll let some more people log on before we begin our discussion. Don't mind me. Oh, goodness.
All right, all right. It is seven o'clock. So why don't we go ahead and get started? I know more and more people are going to be logging in, but I am anxious to begin our discussion. We're moving on from hell. We spent two weeks talking about that awful subject. And now we're going to move on to talking about heaven, something that is much more pleasant, obviously a lot more exciting, and uh, is something that's more appropriate. And I think like um, applicable to you, because most of you, I believe, have placed your faith in Jesus. Heaven is going to be your eternal home, and uh, we want you guys to know absolutely everything you can about it, because it is far more wonderful than probably what most of you believe. Now, before we dig in tonight, I want to uh, let you guys know about something we're doing here at the church. This really only applies to people that are local in Calgary. If you're watching from somewhere else, the Philippines or Texas or wherever, welcome. We're so glad you guys are here. But if you're local in Calgary, I want to tell you that we are having our Easter service on Duh, Easter Sunday. We're going to have an online service, but we're also doing something else, something extra special. We're going to be doing a drive through Easter service in our parking lot. It's going to be amazing. You're going to uh, drive through the parking lot and stop at five different stations. You won't have to get out of your car. Our volunteers are going to be running the stations. They'll be masked. It's going to be totally safe. It's going to be a really, really special morning. You're going to get a good welcome. You're going to get a three minute message. Man, I don't know if I've ever preached a three minute message, but I'm going to try a three minute message and you're going to get three minutes of live worship with Kara and a bunch of our other uh, worship team. You're going to get to take communion. Kyle and Kayla are going to be leading communion. How great is that? You're going to do it right there in your car. And then uh, you're going to have the opportunity to have somebody pray specifically over you as well. So I'm really excited about this. This is such a like crazy idea for sure. Um, we had hoped our building was going to be done, but it's not. And so instead of simply doing an online church service, we said, let's, let's utilize the facilities in the way that we can right now until the build out is finished. And and um, we're going to do this drive through service here in the parking lot. So if you're local and you want to be a part of this service, it's going to take 20 minutes basically to drive through from start to finish. Uh, but I, I do believe it'll be meaningful. So if you want to participate, you have to register because we've got a limited number of spots that we can do on that Sunday. So go to connectcalgary.ca slash Easter. Kyle just dropped that in the chat for you. You can click that link. It'll take you right to the registration page. We do need everybody to sign up so we know how many cars to plan for and all that sort of good stuff. But I really do believe this will be one of those Easter's. You're like, remember when we did a drive through Easter service? How weird was that? But it'll be good. I promise you're going to leave the parking lot saying, wow, I've experienced Easter Sunday at church with my brothers and sisters. Don't miss it. Okay. All right. Let's get started here. Let's talk a little bit about the subject of heaven. I remember one time that I was listening to a pastor preach, and uh, it kind of in passing, this wasn't a sermon on heaven or anything like that. He referenced 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse 9. And I want to put this here on the screen for you so you can kind of see this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse 9. He referenced the fact that this verse says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human mind has conceived the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Maybe you've heard this verse before, and you've heard it used in the same way that uh, this pastor that was preaching that night used it. I was a young Christian, and so he basically referenced this verse, and he said, look, I know a lot of Christians are really hung up on heaven, and what's it going to be like, and you know, this question, and that detail, and all that. He was like, don't even worry about it, because nobody can answer those questions. In fact, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And because I was young and I didn't know any better, I just kind of said, oh, okay, I guess God has seen fit not to really tell us anything about heaven. And maybe it's a lack of faith or it's even sinful to ask questions or to try to understand what heaven might be like. And so I just assumed that there was nothing to be known on the subject, okay? Okay. I kind of thought heaven is going to be so very different from earth as we know it that our brains probably couldn't even comprehend what it was going to be like. But later, I discovered that there is a major, major problem with reading 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse 9, and using it as a proof text 
to, to teach that we can't know what heaven is going to be like, all right? So here's what I want to do. Um, the answer is actually right there on the screen. The answer to why using 1 Corinthians 2.9 that way is a bad idea. It's right there on the screen in front of you. So if you kind of have a sense of why I'm saying that verse does not mean that we can't know anything about heaven, just unmute yourself. Go ahead. Give us a little bit of wisdom. Why is 1 Corinthians 2.9 not telling us that we can't know anything about heaven? What do you think? All right, I'll just let it go. I mean, I don't have that much info to cover tonight, so we'll just leave it awkwardly silent for a long time. All right, so I'll give you a hint. It's in the context. Context or surrounding verses. Well, it does say, if they had known... They would not have crucified the Lord of glory, but Jesus was crucified. So it's a bit of a, a contrary statement. Okay. That's interesting. I hadn't really considered that. That wasn't the thought that came to my mind, but that's an interesting point for sure. And uh, yeah, that, there's definitely truth to that. How about this? Just how about the very next verse? Verse number 10. Okay. So if we read 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 only, all right, it says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human mind can conceive what God has prepared for those who love him. But it says in the very next verse, these are the things that God has revealed to us by his spirit, okay? So if you notice here in verse number nine, Paul says, however, as it is written, and then you'll notice these words are, uh, they're set apart by quotation marks, okay? This is literally a reference to an Old Testament passage. So Paul actually is saying the exact opposite of what that preacher told me that Paul was saying here, and the thing that I thought for so long. This verse does not say that we can't know what heaven is going to be like. In fact, Paul's very point is God has told us exactly what he has laid up in store for us in eternity. Here's the truth, you guys. God has given us tons of information regarding heaven, tons and tons and tons. The problem is either we don't like know where to look in the Bible, or we kind of overlook the things that we read. Remember, I told you a couple of weeks ago, the Bible is not written like Wikipedia. It, it, when it comes to Wikipedia, if you want to know about a subject, you just type the subject into the search bar, and then you get everything there is to say on that subject in one place. There is no book of heaven. There is no chapter in the Bible that describes heaven only. There are lots of places where heaven is discussed throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so you've got to read through the entirety of the scripture to get a full picture of heaven. So what Paul is saying here and the encouragement I want you guys to have tonight is that God has placed so much information and so many clues about eternity that, um, yeah, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised by a lot of what is in here, okay? So let's start off tonight by looking at some New Testament vocabulary, okay? What I mean by that are some words that are used again and again throughout the Bible, but particularly in the New Testament. They also exist in the Old Testament, but that's okay. Words like reconcile. You hear reconcile a lot in the New Testament. Words like redeem or redemption, okay? Words like restore, recover, return, the return of Jesus, or the return of the lost sheep. Renew or renewal is a word that's found many times in the Bible. Regenerate, regenerate, or even resurrect. That's a really common one, right? So let me ask you, this is an obvious question. I promise it's not a gotcha, okay? The obvious answer is the correct one here. What do you notice about these words that I've highlighted? that are from the Bible, this New Testament vocabulary. They all start with R. Okay, they all start with R and then one more. <laughs> That's true. 
R E. R E. They all start with the same prefix, R E, re, okay? And that that uh, that word re in English, it's R E. In Greek, it's the exact same thing. It's just spelled differently. It's A N A, Anna, okay? Anna, like anagram, that word, it means to rearrange the letters. That's what the word anagram means, right? Um, so in English and in Greek, we have this prefix, R E, in, in our language, okay? And it literally means back or again. That's what it means, back or again. So when something is redeemed, it is purchased back. It is purchased from someone else who owned it. You once owned it, you sold it, now you or lost it, now you get it back. If something is resurrected, it is uh, resurrected. It is brought back to life, okay? So over and over again, in the New Testament, we see these re-words in which God is doing something again that is tied to and dependent on what he had done first or what he has done in the past. This is a really, really strong theme that you see throughout the Bible, okay? And so the reason that I bring this up is because I believe, and I this is like, it's not just like, hey, this is Pastor Dan's opinion on this. This is what Christianity has taught like since the very beginning, okay? That God's plan is to bring us back or to cause to happen again in the future what has already happened in the past. Now, if that's a little, you're like, what is this guy even talking about tonight? Stay with me. I promise you it's going to lead to a really strong understanding of what heaven is going to be like. Let me, um, let me point out to you that human history, okay, all of history can be divided into three sections of time, three epochs, right? OK, and we could talk about them in terms of past, present and future because we use those words. Right. We talk about our past. We talk about our present. We talk about our future. But when we look at the way the Bible describes these three central periods of time throughout history, the past is really, really small. The present is incredibly long and the future goes on forever. OK, so you could divide up the entirety of the Bible. And the entirety of human and our universe's history, like you see here on the screen. The past portion is Genesis 1 and 2, okay? The things that we see happening in Genesis 1 and 2 are the past. It was something that used to be true of us and our world, but is no longer true in the present. There was a change that happened between Genesis, or once we get to Genesis 3, there is a change. There is a break with the, the existence that we had previously. Then everything from Genesis 2 or Genesis 3 all the way through Revelation 20, so the entirety of the Bible, everything from 10,000 years ago to at least 2021 today, and maybe long into the future, who even knows? All of this is the present epoch, the present like um, section of time that humanity lives in. There will be a future epic as well, a future period of time in which what is true today is no longer true. And that defining moment happens in the, in the difference between Revelation 20 and Revelation 21, because the future, the eternity that God has planned for every single one of us, it, it is spelled out for us. It begins in Revelation 20 and 21, and then it goes on throughout eternity. So catch this for a sec, okay? The original creation is described in the first two chapters of the Bible, and the eternal creation is spelled out for us in the final two chapters of the Bible. Everything in between is this present existence, this present world, this present reality that we live in, which is defined, unfortunately, by sin. Sin is the defining quality and characteristic of the present that we find ourselves in. Okay, I think you're following me. Do you have any questions there? If you do, feel free to unmute, jump in here. I, I, think, I'm, I think you're tracking with me so far, but I wanna make sure, okay? We have the past, which is defined by Genesis 1 and 2, or that epic, the first one. Then we have our current one, and then we have the future. Any questions there? Yeah, uh, Pastor Dan, I do, um, just my opinion. 
Oh, well, I think uh, uh, the past did not start in Genesis 1, but way before, because there was already God before yep. uh, the creation. So there was a past, uh, infinite past, even before the creation. So I would say yes and no, um, without getting too deep in the weeds here, God exists both within time and outside of time. And so um, there was a time in which time began. And before that, our language and our, our mental capacity breaks down. There's really no way for us to even speak of how God could exist before space time, space and time were created. Now, you're right in the sense that what I'm telling you, Genesis 1, is not the beginning of God. It's the beginning of our universe, our story. And in the same way, Revelation 20 and 21 are not the end of everything. It is the end, or it is the beginning, rather, of our future story. So we're definitely saying the same thing here. I'm not saying that's the, God existed before Genesis 1. I'm saying this is the human epoch, the time period in which there was something that was true. And once that epoch, that time period ended, things changed and there was a new reality that came on the scene. So in Genesis 3, the new reality was sin. In Revelation, um, and I my slide is wrong, wrong. I'm sorry, guys. That future says 20 and 21. It's supposed to be 21 and 22. Ah, anyway, um, in that future, it's final judgment and the new heaven and the new earth. So that becomes the defining mark in the new uh, the new time period that we're talking about. So yes, we're saying the same thing there. You're right. Thank you Thank for the you. clarification. Thank you. Okay. Okay, any other uh, questions or clarification there? Awesome. Okay, so check this out now. Um, we've got these uh, three periods, okay? And what I just said to you a moment ago was that God is going to bring back or he is going to cause to happen again in our future what happened in our past, okay? So we are currently here in the present, in the future, God is going to renew, restore, redeem, recreate what happened in the past, all right? We might be able to kind of sum it up like this with like our central, like our thought, our thesis here for tonight. The eternal heaven, okay, our future home will be a recreated Garden of Eden. You with me? The future heaven is going to be the recreated Garden of Eden. Our future will be our past. That's why we find all of these re-words used throughout the scripture. Renewal, redemption, reconciliation, resurrection. And I'm going to develop this theme a lot tonight, but I want you to kind of understand the, the point here in the very beginning. The future home that we're going to be in, heaven, is not some disembodied existence off in the clouds somewhere, but what you'll see over and over again in the scriptures is that the eternal home that God has in store for me and you is right here on a renewed, a recreated, a redeemed, a re, uh, reconciled or resurrected earth. God is going to bring again what happened in the Garden of Eden, okay? So let me kind of give you some, um, let me give you some evidence maybe to support this idea, okay? Why would I say that? Why, if, if all we've ever heard is that like heaven is off in the clouds somewhere, we're gonna be angels floating around playing harps and all that sort of stuff. Why would I say that the future has anything to do with the past? The Garden of Eden was a long time ago and we lost that. Uh, so why would I think we're going to get that back? Okay, doesn't God have something better in store? All right, let me um, let me kind of show you some thoughts here from the scripture. Okay, we're going to start by reading uh, Genesis chapter number two, which tells us about the Garden of Eden. Okay, so please remember that our um, our thesis tonight is. Let's see if I can shrink this down a little bit. 
Okay, there we go. Um, our thesis tonight is that the eternal heaven will be a recreated Garden of Eden. And what is true of Eden will also be true of heaven, only it's going to be better. So if we want to know what the future is going to be like, we want to look to the past. All right, Genesis chapter number two, we're going to read verses seven to 14. And what I'm looking for is somebody who would be willing to read that for us just out loud to the group. You can read from a copy of the Bible that you have there. You can read right off the screen if you want to. We're going to read uh, Genesis chapter number two, and we're going to read starting in verses seven and go all the way down through verse number 14, okay? I can do it. Please and thank you. Okay. Verse seven to 14? Yes. Okay. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a tree in, in Eden in the east, and there he placed um, the man he had made. The Lord God made all the sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed a tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A, ri a river flowed from the land of Eden, watering the garden, then dividing into four branches. The first branch he called Pishon flow flowed around the entire land of Havila, where gold is found. The gold of the land is exceptionally pure. Aromatic resin and onyx stone are also found there. The second branch he called Gihon, flowed around the entire land of Cush. The third branch called Tigris, flowed east of the land of Asher. The fourth branch is called Euphrates. That was really good because I didn't even give you a heads up that there were all these crazy names in there. I didn't even <laughs> give you a chance on that. And, I, you know, you followed the pastor's like, this is our mantra, okay? When you get to something in the Bible and you don't know how to pronounce it, just say it as if you knew how to pronounce it. And people are like, oh, I guess that's how you say it. They don't know any better. So that was really well done, Cara. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now, here's what I want to point out, okay? There's a lot to this, but I want to just point out a couple of important things in what Cara just read for us, okay? First things first, the scripture says that Eden was a garden, Okay, a garden. That word is going to be incredibly important. We're going to come back to it in just a moment. Eden was a garden. Okay. Um, I also, I just love the fact that it says God planted a garden. You know what I'm saying? It could have been like God put a garden. You know what I mean? He could have done that, but he planted the garden. It's like there's this care and this intentionality to it. Anyway, I just like that. Okay. We notice in the garden, okay, that there are all sorts of trees that grow up from the ground. Those trees are beautiful. And they produce delicious fruit. In particular, in the middle of the garden here, there is the tree of life. And then, of course, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there are more than two trees in the garden, but there are two that are specifically named and highlighted in this passage. Okay. So, so far, we've got the garden, we've got uh, delicious trees and fruit, we've got one particular tree that's called the tree of life, all right? And then it says there is a river that flowed through, uh, the, the, through the land of Eden, okay? Um, it watered the garden, and then it divided into four branches. So please pay attention here. There's one river, it just splits into four, okay? We notice here that in the land that's encompassed by this divided river, there is a lot. There's gold that the scripture says is exceptionally pure. There are precious stones and specifically onyx is called out here. Okay. So we're starting to see a few like details that we can kind of um, say, all right, if our thesis is that the eternal heaven will be a recreated Eden, then we should see a lot of these same details in the scriptures that tell us about our future home. Are you with me? We're making a prediction here. Will we see these same qualities in our future home? Well, let's take a look. Okay, so we're told most, like the, the clearest passages about the eternal heaven that we will all go to after the resurrection and the final judgment day, the clearest um, places that we read about it are Revelation 21 and Revelation 22. Now, the other places in the Bible that give us the clearest picture of the eternal heaven are, weirdly enough, in the Old Testament. 
So most of the information that we have about our eternal home comes from Revelation 21 and 22 in the New Testament, and the rest from books like Isaiah and Ezekiel in the Old Testament. All right, so now we're, I'm going to read this part because we're going to read and kind of jump around because there's a lot of information. We don't have enough time to read all of it, okay? But I want you to notice here, um, the scripture says, uh, we'll go down to verse three here. Um, John, the apostle, is having a vision of our future home. And he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Remember, we've talked about this multiple times, a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth, the current heaven and the current earth had disappeared. And he says, the sea was also gone. Don't freak out. I've had people be like, there's no ocean in heaven. Oh my gosh, I love snorkeling and I love fish and dolphins. How can there not? It's okay. It doesn't mean it's not that literal. There's actually good news there. Okay. John says in verse two, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. So watch this now. Heaven in this passage is pictured first and foremost, like a city. And so John uh, in verse three says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. All right. Now, although Eden was described as a garden and right here, we see uh, the, the heaven or Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem described as a city. There are actually a few parallels that we're going to start to see come out. Although we didn't read this in, in Genesis 1 and 2, the scripture tells us, and 3 actually, the scripture tells us that in the Garden of Eden, the defining characteristic of it was the fact that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden every single day. That's Genesis 3, right? And so we see that same parallel here in which uh, we're told here, and we're also going to be told again in Revelation 22, that God is among his people. He is with them. He is not separated from them, off in some heaven somewhere while they are on earth. So we're seeing the first parallel, God and man are joined together here on earth. Okay. Now, if we uh, jump on down to verse number nine, look at what we read. Okay. This is, things start getting pretty crazy here. We'll read from nine to 21. So I'm just going to highlight a little bit and then we'll uh, keep scrolling. Okay. So uh, he says, John, he says, then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues. If you want to read more about that, read the earlier verses. Uh, he said to me, come with me. I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain. And he showed me the holy city. So he's referencing what he just saw come down out of heaven, Jerusalem, which was descending out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and it sparkled like precious stones, like jasper as clear as crystal. He says the city had walls and the city wall was broad and high with 12 gates that were guarded by 12 angels. Now, we didn't read this either, again, because I don't have time to, you know, we can't read every little parallel, but it's interesting because when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden in Genesis 3, what did God place at the entrance of the garden? Do you remember? He placed an angel, an angel to guard the entrance. And we find here that there are angels that are actually guarding the entrance to heaven, okay? It says the names of the 12 tribes of Israel are written on the gate. There were three gates on each side, east, north, south, and west. So 12 gates in all around the city. The scripture says the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones and on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb. Now look at verses 16, uh, 15, 16, and 17. This is bananas, you guys. I love this, okay? It says the angel who talked with me held in his hand a golden tape measure. Okay, a golden measuring stick to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. And when he measured it, he found that the base of it was a square, okay, equal on all sides. And uh, he says, um, sorry, uh, when he measured, he found it was a square as wide as it is long. In fact, its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles. So 1,400 miles this way, 1,400 miles this way. So this is a really, really, really big city, okay? This is roughly 2.2 million square miles. And um, I, sorry, I'm American. Hey, Siri, what is 2.2 million square miles in kilometers? 
It's 5,697,973.8. Thanks, lady. 5.7 million square kilometers. Now you're like, damn, that seems like a pretty big number, but like, how does that, I mean, I don't know. Do you have any sense of context for it? Okay, check this out. The size of the city of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven is not far off. It's not quite as large, but it's not not too far off from the size of Australia. Australia. Okay. Australia. That's how big the city is. I was like, oh, maybe it's like roughly the size of New York. It's like eight times the size of New York City. It's crazy. And if you're paying really, really close attention here, we're told that Jerusalem, this city, which is the hub or the epicenter of the new earth, which is heaven, okay, is not just 1,400 miles long and 1,400 miles deep. It is 1,400 miles tall. The city is actually described as a cube. Now, right now, I am sitting on the second floor of our office building. I'm up off the ground, okay? And in the future, New Jerusalem, the, the, the eternal heaven, we are told that it's not just going to be built wide and low, it is going to be built up really, really high. Check this out. This is absolutely crazy. If it were 1,400 miles high, it is way, 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 way out in outer space, okay? It would be 600,000 stories tall, okay? You would have to be at least 10 miles away from it to start to see the top of the cube, the city of Jerusalem. It's bananas how big it is. I did the math on it, and I, I, like, I can't even remember the numbers because it's too many commas, but basically... It's like 3.3 billion cubic uh, miles, okay? And that is like eight times the total surface area of the entire earth. Like when it says there's this city, don't think like, oh, it's Red Deer. <laughs> no, like, this, is, this is unbelievably huge. It would be the biggest thing that anybody has ever seen on earth and apparently ever will see as well. So we see this picture. Sorry, I'm getting kind of off track here. I know I'm supposed to be pulling out these parallels, but I just, I'm blown away by this. I really am. I think it's absolutely fascinating. Okay. So he, uh, the scripture says he also measured the walls and found them to be 216 feet thick. And then notice what he says here. He says, according to the human standard that was used by the angel. Okay. So like, what's really important here is you could look at this and be like, well, this has got to be like symbolic or something like that. Right. But if that's true, why did they use such precise human measurements? Right. Like, it seems very strange that there's like this actual measuring device and we get a very specific number. Could it be symbolic? Yes. But everything here in the text leads us to believe that heaven, or at least the epicenter, the, the, the home base, so to speak, of the eternal heaven is going to be this unbelievably massive city. All right. He goes on to say, the walls of the city were made uh, of jasper, and the city was pure gold. Now, remember back in Genesis 2, what's one of the things they highlighted about the land? That it was full of pure gold, right? The wall of the city was built on foundation stones inlaid with 12 precious stones, jasper, sapphire, agate, uh, emerald, Onyx, which, by the way, was uh, one of the precious stones that was mentioned back in Genesis 2, carnelian, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, something else I can't pronounce, jacinth, amethyst, right? Like there are all these precious stones that are here and we're starting to see connections or patterns, similarities between Genesis 2, the Eden paradise and uh, Revelation 21 and our future home, okay? We also notice here, um, I saw no temple in the city for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb or its temple. Remember, God is with his people. There's no church. He's just there with people, okay? We could go on to Revelation 22, and we'll see a couple more of these similarities, all right? Um, if we go all the way down to here. Uh, the angel showed me what? A river. Okay, so what was one of the defining characteristics in Eden? There was a river that flowed right through the middle of it. The angel showed me a river with the water of life 
clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. It flowed down the center of Main Street. This is basically like Venice, okay? Just waterways, all right? This big giant river. It's not really Venice, I'm kidding. Okay, on each side of the river grew a tree of life. Remember, the tree of life, there was one tree of life in Eden. Now, on each side of the river, we have a tree of life. And the tree of life bears 12 crops of fruit. Remember, Eden, Genesis 2, trees were bearing delicious fruit. And here we see more fruit. In fact, the scripture tells us this is more than food. It's medicine for the nations. Verse 3 says, no longer will there be a curse on anything. Again, we didn't read this, but those of you that are familiar with Genesis 3, what happens when Adam and Eve uh, break the command, they eat the fruit they weren't supposed to and violate uh, God's commandment? There is a curse that is placed both on them individually, them as a couple, and even on all of creation. And here in Revelation 22, we see that the curse is undone. It's another tie back to Genesis 2, okay? It says, they will see his face, God's face. Uh, oh, sorry, for the throne of the God, uh, throne of God and the lamb will be there and his servants will worship him. They will see his face. His name will be written on their foreheads. And there will be no light there, no need for lamps or suns, for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever. Then the angel said to me, everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. The Lord God who inspires his prophets has sent his angel to tell his servants what will happen soon. Okay. So here's what I think, okay? And maybe that's not super convincing to you, but I can tell you, this is, again, not just my opinion. This is what theologians have understood and believed for, um, you know, the 2,000 years of, of the church, that our future home, the new heaven and the new earth, is itself anchored by a giant city right here on earth in which all of the things, or at least most of the things that were true of Eden in our past, will be brought back and they will be made better in our future home, okay? Now, if I still haven't convinced you, let me give you one more thing. And to me, this is just like the cherry on the top, you guys. I, I almost forgot about this. And like two hours ago when I was finishing up all of my like slides and stuff, I was like, <gasps> I almost forgot to include this, and this is like the best part, okay? All right, you're going to have to unmute here for a sec, all right? When Jesus was on the cross, he was crucified between two thieves. One of the thieves reviled him, talked smack about him, and the other said, uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So he was respectful of Jesus on the cross. What did Jesus say to that respectful or to that penitent thief on the cross. If you remember, just unmute, share it with the group. Today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. Okay, here it is. This is uh, Luke chapter number 23. Um, the thief said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, I promise you, I guarantee you, verily, verily in the King James. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, here's what's so cool, okay? What word does Jesus use here to describe heaven? Paradise. He calls heaven paradise. Now, what is paradise? What is that word? What does it even mean? Okay, this is why I was trying to pull up an interlinear Bible, which is like an English and Greek Bible right next to each other. But I don't know why this website is now. Oh, now it's going to load. Okay. All right. Bear with me, you guys. I wasn't planning on doing it this way. Um, this is a great website, by the way. This is BibleStudyTools.com. I use this a lot. I use Bible Gateway if I'm just searching like for a verse. But if you want to study Hebrew or Greek, this is the best place to do it, I think. And I'll show you why. If we go to tools, and we go to, sorry, I just have it bookmarked, so I have to find out where it is. Interlinear Bible, there it is. We're going to go to interlinear, and it doesn't really matter. You can choose King James or New American Standard. It doesn't matter, but we'll go ahead and put New American Standard. We said this is Luke chapter number, what? I'm lost here. Um, 
20, I think. You 23, said. Luke 23. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're just going to type in Luke 23 and we can hit enter and it's going to bring up all of Luke 23 and we'll figure out what verse it was. Sorry, guys. It was not up there earlier. Crucifixion and it's verse number 43. Okay. So we're going to just add that in so I don't have to scroll forever. Okay. Luke 23, 43 in an interlinear Bible. Okay. Now, what it does here is it includes the English that you see in your Bible. And then down here, it's got all these Greek words and, um, you know, declinations and stuff that honestly, I can't even remember from Bible school. It's not really important because what is important is when you're reading a passage and you're like, I really want to dig in deep. I want to understand what this means. You can come here and you can say, huh, I wonder what the original Greek word for paradise is, and I wonder if there's something interesting about that. So all you have to do is click paradise, and what do you see here that the Greek word that we translate into English as paradise is literally just paradise. It's paradisios. That's how you say it in Greek, okay? Paradisios, all right? So interesting now, the word that Jesus used to describe heaven is paradise, and it's not like some translated word that kind of means something different. It is literally a loan word. You're speaking Greek when you say paradise, okay? Now check this out. What does paradise mean? Okay, a paradise in this word is a grand enclosure or preserve, a park, shady and well-watered wild animals you could go on but look at look at number two it's a garden it's a pleasure ground jesus says today you're going to be with me in the garden you're going to be with me in paradise okay this is so good it's like one of the clearest connections between our future eternal heavenly home and the original Garden of Eden, okay? So remember what I told you a few minutes ago, that the thesis is the eternal heaven will be a recreated Eden. It will be on earth, and the things that were true in Eden will also be true in our future home, except with uh, a few upgrades. It's going to be even better. For instance, the original Garden of Eden had the potential for sin, had the potential for death, had the potential for things to go wrong. Our new heavenly home, the recreated paradise that God has in store for us, it won't even include that. So when you think about our future, the eternal home, you really need to think back uh, to the, the past, this first period in human history, because that's what God is going to do, okay? He is going to undo the curse that happened in Genesis 3. He is going to renew, recreate, restore, uh, resurrect what was lost from the original paradise that he had created for us. I think that's amazing. Like that is a totally different perspective than the world is evil and I need to escape it. So if I put my faith in Jesus, then I'm going to avoid hell. And one day I'll go float around in the sky with God forever, playing a harp and apparently sitting in a church service that never, ever ends. Okay. All right. So let's pause right there. All right. What, what, what do you take away from this? Is this challenging? Is it encouraging? Have you heard this before? Are you like, no, I've never considered it this way. Talk to me a little bit about what you've heard so far tonight. Yeah, uh, Pastor Dan, uh, uh, I've heard it before, but I've never seen this, you know, very clear parallels between Genesis and Revelation. Well, thank you for that. I, I think God puts those in there for us to discover. There are all these little buried treasures, little nuggets, little pearls that we can pull out. And yeah, we can make too much out of some things sometimes, but like when it literally says there's a giant river running through the middle in one and in the other, I think we're supposed to get that. When one has the tree of life and the other has the tree of life, we're supposed to make that connection. Yeah. All right. What else? Um, I'm just wondering, so, and maybe it's just like the churches that I kind of like grew up, like going to, like mm -hmm. it's, I feel like it's more 
like described as like this very lavish place, like as far as like, you know, like you think of like marble and gold and whatever else, why isn't it described more generally as just like a lush garden or like a yeah, so or nature for, focused as opposed to more like um, material focused, I think. Yeah. I, I think there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, let's say, so let me point out, and we didn't really read this. I, I'm trying to remember if we will read it. Um, I don't know if we actually read all the passages we're supposed to, but if we um, if we go back to Genesis chapter number 22, okay, we, we see like there is, a so we've got precious stones that make up the walls. The streets are literally paved with gold. I mean, that's what the passage says here, right? Um, the... Uh, yeah, and the main street was pure gold, as clear as glass. By the way, I did a deep dive today on like, why does it say the gold, the pure gold is clear as glass? Because that doesn't make sense, right? Like gold is not transparent. It's not translucent. It's opaque. I don't understand. And I still haven't come up with a great answer, although somebody did point out something really, really fascinating, which I had never, ever considered. And that is um, when you see astronauts, okay? And they have that that gold visor, that that golden colored visor. It turns out that is literally gold. It is gold leaf that protects their eyes from like the radiation of the sun and blah 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 blah. And it's just hammered so thin that you can see through it at least from one side. Now, does that mean like the walls in Jerusalem are going to be super thin? I you know I don't know. I don't want to make too much out of it, but I just thought that was really interesting. So, in answer to your question, okay, um, we're told that in heaven, the things that we count as most valuable are going to be common, okay? Gold, one of the most valuable things that's ever existed in the history of civilization is as common as asphalt in heaven. That's the point here. Um, the things that people have fought wars over, blood diamonds and like precious, sorry, precious gems and stones, water rights, all of that stuff, it's just there and it's free and everybody can have it. Now, why do some churches, some theologies tend to downplay this earthly paradise sort of nature and instead kind of play up the, the cathedral, you know, it's like a sacred sort of space and things like that. Um, I think think there are, I, I want to be careful. I don't want to be rude or uncharitable to anybody. Like, I think that they have built their churches in that vein, and they can't imagine that God wants anything different. That is contrary to the very plain reading of Revelation 21 and 22. So in their minds, let me see if I can frame this a little bit differently. In their minds, they're saying if heaven is going to be this beautiful and God sees the beauty in this and values these things, then we should build churches or cathedrals that also have these things because they are a foretaste of what's going to come. And they're gorgeous. Man, Amber and I went to Europe a few years ago. And part of what we did is we just went on like cathedral tours in Italy. And it is, I mean, I like I walk into these buildings and my soul, there is something good even that happens where I'm just like, this is majestic. This is beautiful. And, and there, it's not bad to do those things necessarily. The problem is, I think what Revelation 21 and 22 is trying to tell us is almost the opposite, that heaven, all the things that are scarce and valuable today are going to be quite common. And the things that we will value there are not the same things that we will value here. So it's not that, you know, marble floors and vaulted ceilings and stained glass. It's not that any of that is wrong. It's that we have to be super, super careful that we don't shift our value onto those created things rather than the one who created them. Does that make a little bit of sense? I, I don't, I mean, I, you know, again, there could be a bazillion different ideas, but I, I tend to think that's kind of what's going on a little bit. Okay, um, other questions? I think just uh, adding on to the last uh, question there mm -hmm. too, all of the precious stones and stuff that are mentioned are all like nature and like uh, 
they're not man-made they're naturally occurring so it kind of like adds to that garden or that paradise theme yeah, I love that. That's a great point, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, what, what is interesting, I'll tell you this um, next week, I think we're going to get into the idea that heaven is full of technology. Okay. You're like, what technology, like internal combustion engines and iPhones? I don't know. But when the, when it talks about cities and gates, and we're going to see like kings and queens coming in and out, chariots and all of these different things those are all technologies of the day in which the scriptures were written and they are present in the eternal heaven now it could be that those are the only sorts of technology that are allowed in heaven but i think that would be too narrow a reading um we're going to get into so i don't want to spoil it but like yes so the paradise that God creates for us, it is very earthly, it is very physical, it has value behind it. And I think in the same way that God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, and he told them to tend it, to work it, to, to care for it and produce something out of it, I actually believe that we will work essentially in eternity, but not work in the sense of like, oh, I hate the nine to five grind, like work as in I'm doing something genuinely meaningful. This fulfills me. This is wonderful. We'll get into all that next week. All right. Uh, other thoughts? We're going to keep moving along because we got a few more like hot topic questions that we want to cover here. Uh Quick question. Is there, do we have any sense of where Eden was, mm. assuming it was on earth? Yeah. So um, you may have noticed if we go back to um, Revel, uh, sorry, to Genesis 2, uh, which is right. Um, okay. So you might notice that we're given some names. Okay. The truth is, we don't know what Pishon is. We don't know what Havilah is. We have some guesses about some of these other places. We know Cush. Cush is actually the ancient Hebrew word for the northeastern region of Africa. Okay. So, like Egypt, Ethiopia, kind of down in that direction. All right. Um, and of course, you might remember the Tigris and the Euphrates River. So, the Tigris and the Euphrates flow right through the middle of Iran and Iraq. OK, so this was a big river that encompassed a big region. The Garden of Eden was huge, just like uh, the New Jerusalem is going to be quite large. Now, here's the thing. OK, and Ashur is ancient Assyria. OK, now what we don't know for sure is the river that is called Tigris and Euphrates today is that the same Tigris and Euphrates that is referenced here in Genesis chapter number two. Um, there are good arguments both ways uh, in favor of it being the same rivers is why would God use the names of one if they were changed to a different one? That's just going to cause confusion for people. OK, but the problem is if you try to trace the geography of one river splitting into four that's called these four different things, we can't see it today. Now, some people say that's because of Noah's flood. Some people say that's because God hid Eden after Adam and Eve were kicked out and he never wanted us to discover it. We don't know if Eden is literally like this, un, uh, this, sorry, this undiscovered protected little garden somewhere in the Middle East and we'll never find it because like the second we get close, there's an angel that's like, hey, get out of here, kid. You know, I, I mean, who knows, okay? Like that to me seems far-fetched. I don't know, it seems like satellites might be able to discover it or something, but we don't know for sure where it was. We can be fairly confident that it was somewhere in the Middle East. It most likely was in what eventually became known as the promised land, Israel, um, you know, Palestine, that region right in there. But we can't pinpoint it down to a specific place. And um, I don't know that we ever could really so okay any other questions uh as far as dimensions i think mm -hmm. you had me um at two dimensional and you yep. kind of lost me at the third dimension okay as as height mm -hmm. so it, do you think it's describing height as in like our sky currently has height or is it somehow stacked like I, I'm not sure, I guess, how the height is relevant, if it's just like air. 
Yeah. So, um, okay. So remember, it's a city. What do you often see in cities? Skyscrapers, right? Building. Buildings going up. That, like, like the building you work at, Kyle, is two stories tall. It is up off the ground. So imagine it not two stories, but 600,000 stories. Now I get it. Like, how is that actually going to work? And we don't have the technology to do that. And like, how is a building like in the atmosphere on earth and then up in space? Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't claim to know that, you know, the Bible doesn't give us these answers, but it does tell us very specifically that the walls of this, of this city go up that high that the boundaries of it are defined not just north, south, east, west, but also in this extra dimension, this third dimension as well. So the only, I mean, like to me, what makes the most sense is that we will utilize the full volume of that space. And that's why God includes it, that we will build up as well as building out in the same way that we do here on earth. Okay, um, let's see here. It's 7:55. I want to keep moving pretty quick. Um, yeah, we're gonna do it. We're gonna we're gonna blow through this pretty quick here. Um, so some people might say, but wait, but wait, aren't there some verses? So you're telling me, Dan, that God is going to renew. He's gonna redo Eden on the new earth. But aren't there verses that say that God is going to completely destroy the earth? And um, it, doesn't Revelation 21 like clearly say it is a new earth? If it's going to be renewed, recreated, restored, why doesn't it just say that God is going to restore the earth? Why does it say it's a new one and the old one has passed away? Um, we can kind of answer this again by going to the Greek here. Um, so if we go to, um, uh, let's start with, actually, let's start with the scripture. Um, yeah, here we go. So this is um, 2 Peter chapter number 3. And we're going to read in the King Jimmy version for a moment. Uh, if we read down in verse number 10, okay, verse 10. Oh, I might need to put it on the screen. <laughs> okay. There we go. Sorry about that. Here we go. Um, they say, but wait, First, uh, 2 Peter 3.10 says, but the day of the Lord, so this is the return of Jesus, will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and all the works that are therein shall be burnt up, okay? So that sounds like God is destroying the current earth. And I'm with you, Dan, that God is going to bring a new earth, a new heaven, all that. But it clearly says that God is going to destroy this particular earth. When you're reading the Bible, okay, one of the most important things for you to do is to study the larger context of what's being written, the verses that come before and the verses that come after, okay? And if we go earlier um, in this passage, we're going we're gonna to discover that the reason that Peter writes this letter is this. He says, knowing that in the last days, there will come scoffers, people who are like, Pfft. they walk after their own lust saying, where is the promise of Jesus coming? For since our fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. It's like, you guys keep talking about Jesus is going to come back. There's going to be this consummation. There's going to be judgment day and stuff. But look, it's been decades at this point when he writes the letter. Now it's been millennia. And he's like, there are going to be people that are like, come on, when are you guys going to just acknowledge the fact that Jesus ain't coming back? Okay. So that's the context in which he's writing this letter. And so what he says here is he says, um, they are willingly ignorant of God's promises, okay? That by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth was standing out of the water, all right? So he's talking about creation and stuff. And then he says, therefore, the world was then overflowed with water and everybody in it perished. I don't know why I chose King James to read this. Um, you can see how hard this translation is to walk through sometimes. Okay, so he's drawing a connection here, and it's a little clearer and more explicit in some other translations between what happened in um, Noah's day, Genesis, what is that, Genesis 6? Yeah, I think so. Um, what happened to Noah and the flooding of the earth and to what's going to happen with the firing of the earth, the fire that will come down on the earth, okay? Um, maybe even I brought this up in, I did, I did it in the NIV. I don't, yeah, there we go. Okay, 
All right. So um, he says these these scoffers, they come along. Okay. He says, but they deliberately forget that long ago, God's word, uh, by God's word, the heavens came into being, the earth was formed out of water by water, those same waters. Okay. It was by those same waters that the world of that time was deluge, flooded and destroyed. And so what he's doing here is he's drawing a connection between what happened in the flood and what will happen in the future. Okay. So this first judgment came about as a result of water, but we find that the next judgment is going to be, uh, it's going to come about by fire. And again, the point of it is judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. So with that context, we can start to ask questions. He says, what will happen to the earth in the future is going to be very similar to what happened to the earth in the past when the wicked people in Noah's day were destroyed. Well, when the earth was flooded, did the earth get destroyed? Did it cease to be? Well, like you could argue in some sense, like it was destroyed, like whatever the scale of the flood happened to be, it doesn't even matter. Like there was destruction for sure, but it was more the wickedness that was wiped off of the earth. And the same thing is going to be true in the future judgment that will come to earth. It's not that God is like, wow, this earth is so devastated and destroyed by sin. I got to crumple it all up, burn it like a ball of paper and start over. No, no, no. God is going to use fire to execute judgment on wickedness, on evil, injustice in our world. And that is going to be the sort of judgment that takes place. So yes, there are verses that kind of are like, wow, it's like talking about destroying the earth. But when you look at it in context, it's not destroying the the geographic ball, the planet Earth, it is destroying the wicked cultures that exist on Earth, even the wicked people as well. And then one more thing that we'll point out here, and we can go back to the um, to this interlinear Bible. Um, so if we were to go to uh, Revelation 21, okay, Revelation 21, 1, um, okay, oh, you're supposed to be on the interlinear, sorry. Give me one moment. Here we go. Okay. Revelation 21, one. Okay. So it says, I saw a new heaven and then there is um, first or old. Okay. If we just click on that word new, and we're like, what does this mean? Okay. What does it mean when it says there's a new heaven? Okay. We're told that the new heaven, okay. It can either mean recently made, fresh, recent, unused, unworn. It can also mean of a new kind, unprecedented, novel, uncommon, unheard of. Well, that doesn't really clear stuff up too much. Um, so is there any other way that this word or any other place that this word is used in the scripture that can help shed light on what it means and how it should be understood and defined. Well, I did some digging. I did it off screen so you didn't have to kind of like follow along with me, okay? Remember the word here is new and sorry, I should point out to you, the Greek word is kainos, kainos, okay? If we go to 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 17, one of the most famous verses in the Bible. And again, I don't know how to website. Sorry. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Okay, it says this. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new. Uh-oh, that's that new word. I wonder if it's the exact same word. We click on it. And what do you know? ka ha -inos. Okay, it's the same word. So go back and look here at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. The first things is literally what that word says. If you were to click on this, it's the same word as Revelation 21, 1. The first things have passed away and behold, new, there's the same one again, new things have come. Now, when, when we speak of somebody being a new creature or a new creation in Christ, do we mean that? the old, like when I got saved, the, the, the Daniel that existed the day before, was he destroyed? I mean, I guess you could argue in some sense, maybe, and I'm totally new in Jesus, but like, it's still me, same identity. I look the same. I have the same struggles. I sound the same, you know, it, it's the same. And so this word new, when it's used this way in the Bible, it doesn't mean like the old thing was completely scrapped and then something new was created in its place. But there is some sort of change that takes place that transitions it from what it was 
to what it should be, okay? It's almost like we go all the way back to what I said before in these periods of time. And there is this transition that happens. And this transition, the new earth, this transition moment happens in between Revelation 20 and Revelation 21. So uh, when you dig in, okay, across the board, scriptures from front to back, they all, 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 uh, they give us the sense that our future is tied to our past. And this paradise that God created for Adam and Eve that we were all supposed to originally live in, in which there wasn't suffering, there wasn't sin, there wasn't adultery, there wasn't like whatever, okay? That is what God wants to recreate for us in our eternal home. It is going to be a garden, a city paradise right here on earth. Now, look, apparently I came up with way too much content. So I'm going to shift some of these questions over to next week. Like, will we have bodies in heaven? How old will our bodies be in heaven? Will our bodies be perfect in the eternal garden? Will we be male and female? Or will we lose our gender in some way? Will we recognize each other? Will we wear clothes? Will we eat food? We're going to answer all of those questions next week. But Okay, before we sign off tonight, Ashton actually had submitted a question and a really good one. And um, oh, there's a couple more questions that I have missed so far. Okay, um, she asked last week about the seven deadly sins. So remember, last week was about hell. We were talking about like whether or not um, somebody who did small sins would be punished by, you know, in the same way that somebody who did you know, serial killings and stuff like that. And she was like, what about the seven deadly sins, right? Like I've heard so much about this in past churches, you see it in movies, you know, literature and all that sort of stuff. Like, why are the seven deadly sins so bad and deadly? Okay. Um, I don't even remember what the seven deadly sins, I can't name them all offhand, um, like envy and sloth and greed and is it murder or rage? I don't even know. You can Google them if you want to. Here's the short answer, okay? The seven deadly sins are never, ever, 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 ever mentioned in the Bible, period. It never, there's nowhere in the Bible that's like, there are seven especially deadly sins. It doesn't exist. It, there's nowhere, okay? So what happened was each of those things are spoken of individually throughout the pages of the Bible. So the Bible says that we should not be greedy. The Bible says sloth is a very bad habit for a person to have. That, um, you know, lust is something that we need to control. It speaks about each of those things that have been categorized as seven deadly sins. It talks about them, yes, but individually, and it never says, this one, these ones are especially bad. It just, it doesn't exist in the Bible anywhere, period. What happened was along about the Middle Ages, there were some priests and some writers, and they were seeing some of these qualities in people in their day. And they were like, our people are really suffering because sloth has become a real thing. It was like the middle age equivalent of failure to launch. Guys never move out of mom's basement. They just sit around playing computer games all day. And so they're like, we need to address sloth. They lived in a time in which gluttony was a huge problem. People would eat and eat and eat, and then they would throw up and they would eat and eat more because eating was a sign of wealth and privilege and status in their society. And so what they did was they kind of brought these seven kind of separate sins together. And they said, in our culture, we need to get a, a handle on these. OK, and then over time, people just started to repeat seven deadly sins, seven deadly sins. It'd be sweet if we made a movie about it. Right. And it became this whole thing all on its own. But it doesn't actually come from Scripture. Now, there is one place in the Bible in which there is a list of sins that God especially hates. And to be honest with you, I didn't pull it up and I don't remember the reference offhand. If anybody knows it or you want to Google it. By all means, unmute and tell me, and we can share it with the group. It's Psalms, I believe, could be Proverbs. I don't know. It may even be like one of the prophets. It's somewhere in the Old Testament. I'm just forgetting offhand. And it says there are, uh, I don't even remember the number. I probably shouldn't have even stuck my foot in my mouth here. I think it's there Proverbs are, 6. Proverbs 6. Um, amazing. 19. Thank you guys for bailing me out. I'm going to look that up. Proverbs, I'm sorry, what is it? 6. 619. Amazing. Thank it's you so much. 
Okay. 16 to 19. Okay. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. Here we go. This is exactly what I was thinking. You guys are fantastic. Okay. So the scripture here says, there are six things the Lord hates. No, seven things that he detests, things that are especially bothersome to him. Haughty eyes. I, what translation am I even reading out of here? There's a new living. Okay. Haughty or proud eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness, like somebody who lies, a liar, uh, or a person who sows discord, strife within a family. Now, if you look at that, okay, some of those will correlate to the seven deadly sins, and then some of them have no counterpart on the seven deadly sins list at all. So if we wanted to talk about seven things that God really, really hates, it, he tells us specifically what they are, and some of them are as bad as the typical seven deadly, but some of them seem like much smaller and we wouldn't really consider them. But for some reason, God especially, he is bothered by these. So there you go. That's a little bit on the seven deadly sins. It's just not in the Bible, at least not in the way that um, our friends over in the Catholic Church typically present it. Okay, one more question um, that was submitted. Is there a possibility that the new Eden is just a holding place while God creates the new earth. Uh, maybe he's just spring cleaning. Uh, I like how you put that. I'm going to say no. And the reason is because we don't have the new Eden, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven until there is a new earth. So we read in Revelation 21, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Then an angel takes him on the new earth to the top, the pinnacle of a mountain. And it's at that point he sees the new Jerusalem, the city coming down out of heaven. So um, if I'm understanding your, your question correctly, the order is like, as God is unveiling heaven, our eternal home, he creates the new heaven on the new earth, and it is anchored by this city itself. So Eden will be, what we're going to see next week, okay, is that Eden is going to be like, the core, maybe the like the downtown, but it is not going to be all of heaven. Heaven is going to encompass, I, I promise you guys, this is so good. Heaven is going to encompass not just the new Jerusalem, not just the new earth, it will encompass the new heavens that God creates, okay? So heaven is going to be so, I, I, I'm trying not to spoil too much because I get really stoked about it. Heaven is going to be so much bigger, so much better. There's going to be so much for us to discover, to explore. There's going to be so much work for us to do. Work that like exists here on earth already. And I believe there will be work in heaven that we couldn't even imagine right now, either because the technology doesn't exist or it's only something that's going to be possible in eternity. I don't know. We know there's going to be government. We're going to talk next week about the fact that uh, at least the 12 apostles are told that they are going to rule. Christians are going to sit in judgment over sinful angels. And so there's so much to talk about, man. This is why I get so I'm like, people are like, I don't want to go to heaven. Heaven sounds boring. I'm like, bro, you're reading about the wrong heaven because the heaven I read about is way better than anything anybody ever told me about. Okay. That's what I've got. We've got just a moment or two for one more. Yeah. Heaven is Australia. Check. That's right. Anywhere with kangaroos is heaven for me, but um, all right. Um, any other questions, anything you want to discuss in the last minute or two that we have? Um, something I just thought was interesting as you were reading the six sins that God especially hates mm -hmm. is th it seems to correlate to like all of our senses. There was like one for touch, one for, the, or like, it, it reminded me, me very much of the uh, body of armor that Paul talks about. Okay. Yeah. And it's like head to toe. It's like, mm. it covers eyes, tongue, feet, I don't know. No, I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I don't. I, I would have to dig in and tease out, like, do they correlate directly with senses or not? But you're very right. It seems to correlate clearly with the very with various body parts: hands, heart, eyes, tongue, feet. Yeah, that's interesting. I I hadn't even made that connection. Good work. All right, anything else? 
Yeah, uh, Pastor Dan, really very exciting session tonight, today, tonight. Um, because especially for me, I thought uh, before that, yeah, I, I want to go to heaven, but if I will just have to sing there, and I, I love to sing praises, but not all the time. But the idea of working in heaven, because right here on earth, there are so many things you want to do. But there in heaven, there is like a continuation. You can do the things you want to do. What more? Uh, no deadlines. Because yeah. uh, eternity, <laughs> we have all the time in the world, in the world in heaven. Thank that's, you. <laughs> that's so right. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, and we're going to get into some of that over the next week or so. All right, I'm going to pray for you guys. If you have further questions and stuff, we can cover them next week. Either drop a question in the chat, send me an email, and uh, yeah, looking forward to continuing the conversation next week. We've only got. Uh, at least one more week for sure. And then we're going to kind of see how much we're able to cover. There will likely be one final week after that. So next week and then the week after. And then our group is fairly done. So if you've got questions, things you still want to discuss, make sure you get those questions in as soon as possible so that I've got time to answer them. Okay. All right, let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you so much for the encouragement and the hope that we've seen from your word tonight. God, I am more excited about eternity with you than I ever was before. And it all comes from your word and truly understanding what you've placed in there for us to discover. And so God, I pray that this would not be the end of our discovery process, that each of us would read your word and God, we would learn who you are and what you have in store for us. I mean, the hope that lays in front of us is so, so good, God, and it should change the way that we live here on earth right now. So God, help us to live in light of eternity. Help us to live with the hope of your coming promises. We ask all this in Jesus name. Amen. All right, you guys, we will see you next week. Thank you, Pastor Dan. Thanks, Thank so. you very much. God bless you all. And to you. Pastor Dan. Thank you. Yes, yes.